Hey guys, here's your review for our discussion today on the war on Earth. Here are the three things we talked about. Talked about uh, Satan first, and then Israel and the road to war. Starting off with Satan, we reviewed uh, from scripture what we learned from him. That his name Lucifer actually means the uh, shining star. Talked a little bit about what's the deal with, especially in Revelation, stars and angels kind of being synonymous. Um, is this just a play of words or is there something more to it? You know, are stars more than just balls of gas up there? What's the deal with uh, stars and angels and angels and stars kind of being referred to each other? So talk a little bit about that. Uh, we know that Satan, where he came from, uh, he fell from heaven. We know what was his uh, his goal anyways, found in Isaiah 14, how he told himself that he would ascend to heaven and set his throne above God's stars again, their stars again. Um, don't know. Does that mean a, he wants to be above the universe or above the angels? Um, he said that he, would, he wanted to preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. Again, that mountain in the north and how he thought he would climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. So that's what he wanted to do. Um, obviously did not attain that, and it's kind of what caused his rebellion. Um, however, he was created as the model of perfection, full of wisdom. Uh, I was talked about how smart he is. He has experience. He's been doing this for thousands of years. Um, yes, he is smart. He's full of wisdom. He's good at what he does, but he can be beaten. Um, He's not like God. He's not equal to God. And in all his wisdom, he can still be beaten. You just got to know the way that he works. Uh, we know he was uh, created um, exquisite in beauty. So he was created a beautiful angel, a prideful angel. Um, but he was banished. He was banished from the holy mountain of God, or that mountain in the north again. And he was banished because of his ambition to be above God's stars and be like the most high. So kind of get it. We got from uh, Ezekiel his uh, his job before he was a mighty guardian, um, but he was expelled from that when rebellion was found in him. Um, kind of dove a little on that mountain of God in the north. Uh, here's some things I found. Now, there's a lot of legends out there about some... Uh, mountain or place in the north um, the two most popular ones are the legends of mount maru and shangri-la so if you want to dive a little bit more into this idea of a mountain being in the north a mountain of god or mountain of the gods um, go ahead and check out uh check out those two legends got some uh interesting details about this mountain in the north All right anyways moving on uh we talked about Satan in Eden and in the Garden of God and the question came up, you know, how exactly did that work? Is, you know, is, is he a shapeshifter? Um, did he possess the serpent? Um, how did the serpent talk? Um, we know that in the Book of Jubilees it says the animals used to talk. Um, we know they have the ability to talk. In the Book of Numbers we see how God opened the uh, voice of a donkey. Um, to give a message to his, uh, to Balak and how he was able to talk. So the animals have, uh, they have the, the ability to talk, but in the book of Jubilees, it says after uh, the fall that after the serpent tempted Eve, God closed, uh, their focus so that they could not talk anymore. So, but anyways, with Satan, I don't know. That's a good question. Does he shapeshift? Does he possess? Um, we know we have the account in the Gospel of Judas, how uh, the night that he betrayed the Lord, it says um, Satan entered into him. So maybe it's a possession um, or maybe just influence, you know, influence the serpent um, the way we know that he influences uh, people throughout history. Uh, and then we got into a good discussion on the Nephilim and what they were. Uh, this goes back to uh, Genesis chapter 6. When the sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives, and as a result of uh, their sin, um, the women became pregnant and they gave birth to children who became um, the Nephilim. Uh, we talked about sons of God. I know there's that uh, thought out there about the sons of God being the sons of Seth. 
is kind of one of the teachings out there on there. Um, however, that term sons of God, if you use scripture to interpret scripture in Job chapter one, uh, sons of God is referring to angels at a council uh, with God where Satan was present. Um, also mentioned about some extra biblical texts like the book of Enoch and Jubilees and Joshua uh, that comes straight out and uh, gives more detail about this Genesis 6 account. And in each of those, the sons of God are angels that uh, left their mandate and uh, had intercourse with women. Um, we see in the book of Jubilees, the class of angels that did this was a kind of class uh, or a class of angels known as the watchers. So I know there's a question out there that's like, is this possible? Can angels mate? Um, I thought angels couldn't mate. Um, I don't know. Maybe there's different classes and the watcher class is able to. Um, we know in Hebrews, remember it talked about you can sometimes entertain an angel uh, without even knowing it. So show hospitality. So maybe the watcher class angels looks they look human. They got bodies like humans. Um, there's you've heard of a lot of stories out there where people are in a life or death situation and they pray and someone shows up and helps them, you know, out of a burning car or something like that, saves their life. Then they turn and look and the person's gone, disappeared, disappeared into thin air. So maybe there is watchers among us, um, angels among us, as it says in Hebrews. And, you know, maybe we just don't recognize them. Maybe they do have bodies like us. I don't know. Um, but according to the Book of Jubilees, uh, it was the Watcher class angels that sinned with the daughters of men. And it says also that Enoch testified about this in his book. Um, there's also Nephilim found post-flood in the Book of Numbers, chapter 13, when uh, Israel was sent to scout the land of promise. Uh, before entering it, they said they saw Nephilim there, descendants of the Nephilim, um, in great size. Uh, remember, they said that they looked like grasshoppers compared to them. And that's why they got scared to invade the land. So Genesis 6-4, the Nephilim is pre-flood. But then there seems there's still some uh, Nephilim post-flood. Um, to be a Goliath is a descendant of the Nephilim. Uh, we did not talk, get to talk about how is that even possible that there's Nephilim post-flood. Um, There's a good theory out there that it could have been through the wives of Ham and uh, Japheth going through the ark, um, that it is genetic. Uh, we know that Noah, before the flood, found wives uh, for his sons, for his three sons. So it could have been that uh, some of the wives that he got for them had... Uh, Nephilim genetics in them, and maybe that's how their offspring on the other side of the flood ended up uh, uh, being Nephilim as well. Uh, the Book of Enoch uh, comes out and gives the most detail about this watcher incursion of how the angels, the son of heaven, um, mix with uh, the women and the women conceive and brought forth giants. It also uh, gives more details about those watchers that rebelled how there's 200 of them it gives the names of the leaders of the 200 one in particular azazel um top men to make swords and knives and shields breastplate basically made warfare known to mankind this is uh before the flood so that a sin was uh, assigned to him and there's some other sins like root cutting and stuff like that that those watchers did so basically in a nutshell this watcher incursion in uh, Genesis 6, during the time of Jared, um, really corrupted the earth, not just with bringing forth uh, Nephilim, but also, uh, you know, the things that they taught, um, the warfare and all the other things that they taught that basically led to a corrupt world, um, causing God to have to cleanse it with a flood. So interesting story there. Uh, Book of Enoch gives a lot of detail if you want more on it. Um, Book of Enoch talks about the archangels, the seven of them, um, and how Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel interceded for mankind um, before the flood, seeing everything that Azazel has done, and some Yasa, which was the leader of the Watchers, and the Nephilim, the giants brought forth from the women um, after those Watchers slept with the women, and the destruction that they were bringing. You know, um, we talked about the Liger uh, that hybrid created between uh 
you know, the lion and the tiger. Um, could have to do a little bit more research and maybe get a slide for a future class uh, for you guys. But the big thing with the liger is that with the mixing of the species, there was a gene that didn't make it into the uh, into the mix. And it was the gene that triggered growth stop. So in one of the combinations of the mixing, the the offspring, which was born like a regular lion tiger hybrid, never stopped growing because that gene was missing um, in the hybridization of it. So even to this day, go ahead and Google Liger to get more information. These things are still growing and they're huge. They're huge. Interesting enough, um, the one I saw was called Zeus, which uh, <laughs> we talked a little bit about the Greek mythology and how, you know, it's mythology, but maybe there's some truth to it. Maybe the Nephilim um, or Greek mythology was referring to the Nephilim before the flood. So all cool stuff uh, out there about the Nephilim. Um, saw how God intervened. He gave orders to his archangels um, that he was going to send a flood to cleanse the earth. Uh, Uriel was sent to warn Noah. Raphael was sent to bind Azazel in the desert. Um, you can search up that whore I told you about in Yemen. Uh, where it's believed there's a fallen angel that is buried in that hole. The locals believe that. Who knows? Maybe that's where Az Azazel is buried uh, to this day. Um, knowing Torah and the Day of Atonement, they would always, uh, the Israelites were told to have two goats, one as a sacrifice and the other one to transfer the sin and send it out into the wilderness. And it says, you send it out into the wilderness for Azazel. So I don't know, maybe that goat would go to this hole to feed this uh, imprisoned fallen watcher as a zealot somewhere out there in the desert. Maybe. Um, talked about how Gabriel was ordered to get the watchers to fight each other and kind of have a like a clash of the titans in Greek mythology where the giants just kind of killed each other off, at least that first generation. And uh, how Michael bound Semyaza and all the 200 watchers that did that incursion. Um, and how Peter in the New Testament referred to those uh, 200 watchers that are in prison in, the, in his second letter in chapter 2, verse 4, when he said, God did not spare even the angels who sinned, but threw them into hell, gloomy pits of darkness, into uh, Gehenna or Tartarus. Um, talked about that in the last lesson. Um, he's referring to the watchers of Genesis 6 um, because we know that the, the fallen angels with Satan are still roaming the earth. They're not in prison. Um, they're still wreaking havoc. But the 200 watchers from before the flood are waiting till the day of judgment in prison down uh, in hell. There's some uh, pictures online of actual skeletal remains found of these giants. Um, I know some people think maybe it's photoshopped. Um, of course, they think that, right? Because in our normal history books or history classes, we're not taught this narrative about actual giants existing and roaming the earth. Um, because we're taught, we're also taught things like evolution and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, there could be another uh, narrative to history. Um, I believe these giants did exist. Um, there's been, these are just some pictures. There's a lot more. Just go ahead and Google uh, Nephilim and Nephilim remains and you'll see there's a lot of cases where these giant skeletons have uh, have been discovered throughout the earth. Um, and then about how about their spirits, right? So uh, the Nephilim were offspring of angel and human. Um, they had spirits, but they were not meant to exist. They're abominations. Uh, the Book of Enoch says how the spirits then had nowhere to go after they died. Um, when our souls die, or when we die, our souls go to either heaven or down to Sheol. We have places to go, places prepared for us. Um, these things were never meant to exist, so they have nowhere to go. So when when the Nephilim died, the spirits just became, it says in the Book of Enoch, wandering spirits. Um, evil spirits just roaming the earth. Um, Luke chapter 11, Jesus talking about demons says, gave an interesting comment of how when he, an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert searching for rest. But when it finds none, it returns to the person. Book of Enoch says that these 
demons it calls them or the spirit of the dead nephilim they always hunger and thirst and they're always searching for rest but they can't find it they're just in a state of unrest and it's part of the reason why they look into possession and stuff like that but they're just always unrest causing havoc on earth roaming the earth um this is different from fallen angels so you know, I, I know that demons and fallen angels kind of get grouped into the same thing. Um, but according to the book of Enoch, you know, demons are one thing. They're the disembodied Nephilim spirits. And fallen angels are fallen angels. Angels that rebelled uh, against God. Like Satan's one third or the 200 watchers uh, before the flood. Okay, then we talked about this guy named Nimrod who uh, built Babylon right after the flood when everybody went to Mesopotamia. Um, the next chapter, Genesis 11, talks about how in Babylon, the people there then built a tower. And we all know the story of the Tower of Babel. But, you know, when you read that story in, in Genesis, it's like, what is so bad about it? Why did God get so upset about the people working together and building a tower. I mean, it sounds good, right? They're working together, you know, in community. They're building something with their hands. Like, almost sounds like a good thing, right? Um, we don't get all the details in Genesis. If you look at, through the Dead Sea Scroll text, like the Book of Joshua, the Book of Joshua gives a lot of detail on the Tower of Babel. Um, it comes out and says how Nim, it was Nimrod's idea, the one who had built Babylon to have this tower built and the people came together to do it but it also says that while they were building the tower um, they imagined in their hearts to war against God uh, it says in Joshua they got up to 8,000 feet this tower got pretty high 8,000 feet uh, they were building it I believe it says in Joshua for about 40 something years before God intervened um, because as they were building it, they started thinking, well, we can reach heaven, right? I mean, you're at 8,000 feet. They probably thought, well, we could reach heaven. What are we going to do when we get up there? Well, in the ninth chapter of the book of Joshua, this is a little disturbing. It says that three groups of people formed. One group was planning that when they reached heaven at the top of this tower, they would go in and wage war and fight against God and fight against his angels. Meanwhile, an, uh, another group would then go and murder God with bows and spears. Um, their plan was literally to smite God on his throne with bows and spears. And then the third group would come in and place their own idols on the throne. And then their idols would now be in the throne of the Most High after God was murdered. That was their plan as they were building this tower. Um, no wonder... God said, okay, that's enough of that, and scrambled their languages, destroyed the tower, and then you know the story of that. Um, so what's interesting is after that, as the people spread with different languages, and I didn't mention this today, um, it says there were 70 angels that God said, sent uh, to scramble the languages. So it's believed that the one before the Tower of Babel, there was only one language. And after that, it became 70 languages. Um, and then, you know, today there's hundreds of languages as different dialects form. But there was originally 70 after the Tower of Babel, according to the book of Joshua. So anyways, as they spread, um, they still knew Nimrod, right? Uh, he was, the, it says in Genesis, he was a famous, famous warrior of the time. Everybody knew Nimrod, but since the languages has been scrambled, he became being called many by many different names with the different languages. So we talked about how contemporaries of uh, Nimrod is like Odin in uh, North mythology or uh, uh, Apollo in uh, Greek mythology or Osiris down in uh, Egyptian uh, mythology. These are all the same guy. They're Nimrod, but by different names. And the big one, Baal, B-A-A-L, Baal in the land of Canaan. Um, which was, it's a big deal in the Old Testament. You see Baal a lot. Um, you see the people in the land of Canaan uh, worshiping Baal, um, doing sacrifices to Baal, even sacrificing their own kids sometimes to Baal and to uh, another demon named Molech. So this stuff was, this is the kind of stuff that was 
going on. So it made sense when God told the Israelites to go into the land and kill everybody, kill everything. That, that was always a struggle with me in reading the Old Testament. Like, wait a second. God like is telling the Israelites, hey, when you go to this specific town, don't let anyone survive in that town, even women and children. Like, what's going on with that? Well, when you know about the Nephilim and you see how these evil Nephilim are the ones in these towns and in these land, these uh, these abomination of giants, um, it kind of makes sense why God's like, yeah, take take them out. Do not. Do not let them continue when you settle the land because you don't want to be mixing with this. Obviously, if there's genetics involved, like Nephilim genetics, you don't want a mixing of that with uh, the people of Israel. So, you know, it kind of starts to uh, have the Old Testament make a lot more sense when you know uh, the story of uh, the Nephilim. Not sure why it's been not talked about in mainstream history or even in mainstream Bible teaching. Um why the Nephilim mentioned in Genesis 6 is just never really uh, kind of taught on or, or talked about. But anyways, maybe that's just part of the deception. All right, next we started talking about Israel. Um, not just what's going on right now, but kind of the, the background to Israel um, and the land, right? We had a good discussion, you know, what is it? Is it the people? Is it the land? Answer is yes, it's both, right? It's um, that land is a holy land. Um, talked about the history of the land, how first after the flood, that land belonged to the Canaanites, where the post-flood Nephilim were, where the people were worshiping Baal, right, and doing no sacrifice we just talked about. That's what the land, um, that's who owned the land, the Canaanites. Now, um, I think it's safe to say that Satan was behind that because the practices of the Canaanites was super pagan, um, super demonic, um, Again, the child sacrifice was the worst. Uh, they had a statue of this demon named Molech where they light it up on fire and it'd be glowing red. The statue had arms out and they would place their live baby after, you know, doing a worship orgy and getting, you know, pregnant. The baby would then be placed alive on this glowing red metal statue and they would watch the baby burn alive as it screamed. I mean... It, it makes me want to vomit. <laughs> just thinking about like this stuff. If you want to see more on that, just look up Molech sacrifices in the land of Canaan. This land was pure evil. Um, I think it's safe to say that Satan roamed this land. So what does God do? Is you know he gets he tells this guy Abraham in uh, Ur. He says, Hey Abraham, I want you to go to the land of Canaan. You know that evil land. I want you to go there. Uh, plant your flag, plant your tent, and I promise to give that land to you. Well, the promise gets passed on to Isaac, to Jacob. Jacob gets renamed Israel. He has 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel. And you know the story later on, he saves them from Egypt, goes and gives them the promised land. He has Israel annihilate these evil Canaanites um, and take them out. Um, Satan responds though, right? You know, the Israel, Israelites uh, take the land, they form their kingdom around 1000 BC, and shortly after, about 300 years later, Satan responds. Um, he raises the Assyrians under King Sennacherib, who for no reason just hates Israel. He just hates them for no reason at all, um, probably influenced by Satan. And he goes and he, he invades and conquers Israel. And he succeeds. He, uh, he conquers 10 of the 12 tribes until God then intervenes, sends an angel, and takes out his army in one night. That story is found in Isaiah. Um, so basically, the Assyrians conquered the whole land again, um, except for Judah. God protects Judah until Judah rebels against God and doesn't listen to him. Then God removed his protection, and they end up being exiled to Babylon, and Satan then retakes the land. So you can see throughout history, there's this... Seems to be like this fight over this land um, between uh, God's people and between Satan on who will possess this land. Um, talked about the prophecy that I believe is starting to unfold right now during our time, um, found in Ezekiel 37, where starting in verse 15, where God tells Ezekiel that one day 
he is going to unite all of Israel. The northern tribes join them to Judah. Um, when we say Jews, we're talking descendants of Judah. Um, and God prophesied in Ezekiel 37 that he's just going to then unite all the 12 tribes again and make them one nation once again. This is a prophecy that has yet to be fulfilled. Um, not a lot of people point to the creation of Israel in 1948 after World War II. Um, it's the beginning of this prophecy. However, it's not fully fulfilled, right? You still don't have all of Israel, all the Jews back in the land. Um, they've been slowly going back since 1948. And I believe, you know, with the conflict going on now in the world and how it's increasingly becoming unsafe for Jews and, you know, descendants of Israel all over the world. I could see this. I could see where it becomes so unsafe that people are going to, they're going to start going back to the only place that's safe for them. And that's back in the land of Israel. Now, land of Israel is not a place of peace right now, um, but it is prophesied that one day it would be a place of peace. God said that he would gather the people of Israel from among all the nations. Um, they're still scattered throughout the world. And he promised that he would bring them home to their own land from the places that they have been scattered and that he would save them and cleanse them and they will be his people and he will be their God. So I think we're seeing prophecy unfold in our midst um, as this is, I can see this start to happen. Um, if this conflict continues, I could see where it could, it could end in the land of Israel expanding and Israelites or descendants of Israel from all over the world um, flocking back uh, to their land, probably in preparation for uh, the tribulation that's coming. Um, and it's not only they go back to the land um, where their ancestors lived. Um, God promised that one day that his servant David will be their prince forever. Well, it's like, wait a second, David, David's dead, right? He's in heaven. Well, you know, in the resurrection, I think David will be a part of those who resurrect. And when we get to the millennium, you'll see when the millennium temple is there and all of Israel's back in their land. Finally, um, there is a prince that rules um, in Jerusalem and kind of handles the normal day to day affair around the temple and around the, the seat, you know, the visiting of the Messiah on his throne in the temple and all those sort of things. So perhaps that will be the resurrected David and he will be their prince uh, during the millennium. The temple will be there, though. It is prophesied in the millennium that the temple will be there. Um, the plans are there. Ezekiel 40 and on has the plans to build the temple. All that's missing is the Temple Mount, which right now belongs to Islam, and that's where the Dome of the Rock is. So kind of a contentious spot there. Um, Islam will never give that up, and the Jews want it. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Um, just keep watching Israel. Uh, everything kind of centers around that piece of land and what happens there. So keep an eye on the conflict that's going on there and, you know, kind of how it plays out because it will affect everybody in the world. As you can already see um, in just a month into it, it's already affecting nations all over, even here in America. Okay, um, the road to war. So mention the uh, prophecies in Daniel. Um, the book of Daniel is a great book, especially when referring to end times. Um, the two dreams I mentioned was the one in chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar's dream about a statue with a head of gold, a chest of silver, a belly of bronze, legs of iron, and then a feet that, you know, the 10 toes are a mix of iron and clay. And then he sees a rock come and smash it. You know, um, it matches his dream in, or vision in chapter seven about a beast that comes out or four beasts that comes out, um, a lion with, e with eagle's wings, uh, a bear, a leopard with four heads, and then a fourth terrifying beast, beast that just kind of destroys everything. 
Um, and then Daniel's told, you know, the, the four beasts represent four kingdoms that will arise. But at the end, the holy people of the Most High will be given the kingdom. So those two, chapter two and chapter seven of Daniel, I recommend go, go and read it because it kind of gives an outline of the different kingdoms who have ruled over that holy land um, in history. Um, here's kind of a background of, of history referring to those uh, visions of Daniel. Um, Babylon ruled the land. They are the head of gold and the lion with uh, wings. Then in 538 BC, Persia took over. That's the silver and the bear. Then the Greeks took over under Hellenistic rule and then Hasmonean rule. They're the bronze and the leopard with four heads. The four heads indicating that after Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided into uh, four kingdoms. And uh, back the second half of uh, the book of Daniel talks a lot about you know, those four kingdoms from uh, Alexander the Great and uh, just the Greek influence and the kind of like the skirmish for that land. Um, we'll talk more about that and we'll get that in a later class, but it's all about that land. Um, and then in 63 BC, the Romans came and, you know, they were the legs of iron. They were the terrifying beast that they came and they kind of took over the land. And this was around the time of our Messiah um, coming. Uh, after that, after Rome, it's interesting. Once Rome lost the land of Israel um, in the last, you know, 2,000 years, the rule over Israel has gone back and forth between different. Here's a list of them. Um, after Rome came the Byzantine Empire, you know, down to uh, the Muslim rule of the land. We had the Crusades and the back and forth between uh Catholic Crusaders and uh, Saladin and uh, Islam rule over the land. We had the Ottoman Empire. Um, and then the latest was the British Empire after World War I. And then in 1948, it was given over to uh, Israel. So I found it interesting that after Rome, there was nine rulers. Um, just thinking about Daniel's vision and the statue and the ten toes um, of iron and clay. I don't know what the 10th one would do. I don't know if the Romans would be the 10th toe before everything since they were the iron and then it got mixed with clay with all the other rules or or maybe Israel was one of the 10 toes. But I find it interesting that there's been 10 different rulers of that land after Rome. So maybe that has something to do with the uh, 10 toes in the Daniel chapter 2 vision of the statue um, of the feet mixed with iron and clay. And in his uh, vision of the four beasts, how the last beast had iron teeth and ten horns. So we'll talk more about ten horns in uh, the next class next week. All right, then uh, we finished off with uh, kind of reviewing Revelation chapter 12. Um, the woman closed with the sun uh, being Mary. Um, so chapter 12 in a nutshell, right, you got... Uh, Mary about to give birth to Christ. However, there's uh, this red dragon that wants to stop the birth. Um, I put this slide in reference to a question a few weeks ago about Jesus' birth being actually in September and how it's believed to be September 11th. Interesting date, especially for us Americans. Um, September 11th, 3 BC. Um, Here's a cool picture I found of why that's believed, um, and it's in, Revel it's in reference to Revelation 12. On September 11th, 3 BC, um, the sun was in the constellation Virgo. So Virgo, the virgin, was closed with the sun. When the sun set that evening, within an hour, the crescent moon appeared under Virgo's feet, signifying the Feast of Trumpets, um, which is one of the festivals in Vicus 23, um, Trump is usually being associated with the announcement of a coming king. Well, that night as well, Jupiter, the king planet, um, was in conjunction with Regulus, the king star. And as they became in conjunction, it's, it's believed they would have just looked like a brand new bright star in the sky. Perhaps the, uh, the star that the Magi saw um, in order to begin their journey to find uh, the Messiah two years later when they arrived in the land. Um, interesting too, that 
star that appeared from the conjunction of Jupiter and Regulus was in the constellation Leo, the lion, um, like the lion of Judah, which has 12 stars, which was on the head of Virgo. Um, so like Revelation 12, the crown on her head of 12 stars over the, the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. So based off of Revelation 12 and, uh, you know, the stars, you know, it is believed that there's a theory that uh, September 11th, 3 BC was the actual birth of Christ, which m makes you wonder, um, maybe we'll have to visit September 11th next week on our class because maybe that just wasn't a random date. Maybe there was a purpose to uh, the attack on that day here in America. All right. Uh, didn't get too much into Mary, but, uh, you know, uh, Revelation 12 seems to indicate, and you know, Mary, like the picture of Mary is usually seen with the crown of 12 stars on her head and the moon underneath her feet. So that's all in Revelation or in reference to Revelation chapter 12. Um, as far as Satan playing it, so we know what he wanted to do. Uh, it says in chapter 12, as Mary was about to give birth to the Messiah, Satan knew it. He wanted to stop it. it said he uh, he swept one third of the stars in the sky down to the earth again. Again, stars, um, referring to angels. Um, and he stood ready, ready to devour the child when he was born. We saw that he tried to take out the Messiah. As um, soon as Jesus was born, you know, he couldn't get him at his birth. But uh, when the Magi arrived, he saw an opportunity, and uh, Herod sent his soldiers to slaughter all two-year-olds and younger in Bethlehem. Um, we saw Satan try to take down Jesus when he was an adult in the wilderness for 40 days. Um, he probably thought he succeeded when Jesus was crucified. He probably thought, I got him. I got him. We, victory, right? Until our Lord resurrected three days later and then on his 40th day ascended to the throne, which in Revelation 12, it says, you know, he tried to uh, he tried to devour the son when he was born, but the son was snatched up to God's throne. And then it says after that there was war in heaven. So then after the ascension, it seems like uh, Satan and his angels went and fought against Michael and his angels. So yeah, Jesus' first coming, you know, on earth it may have seemed like he was a suffering servant and didn't do much. Um, However, he did change the world with his first coming for us down here. But not just here on earth, he changed heaven as well. I mean, he caused a major battle to break out between Michael and his angels and Satan and his angels. Um, Satan lost a battle. The dragon lost a battle. We read about in Revelation 12. And him and his angels were forced out of heaven. Um, it says they were, in Revelation 12, that they were thrown down to the earth with all his angels. So I shared about the celestial phenomenon over Nuremberg, Germany in 1561. Um, this is so fascinating. So it was April 14th, 1561 in Nuremberg. And there on the right, you see the actual news article from, uh, from that date um, with the picture and all, kind of trying to describe what people saw. But Many men and women in Nuremberg on that night, or on that day, sorry, reported seeing various orb-like figures shaped up in the sky in the vicinity of the sun. Um, as the, the reports were that the objects appeared to be fighting each other in the sky, like you see in that picture. And then it lasted over an hour until it seemed like the orbs were fatigued and many of them fell down to the earth in smoke. Reminded me of the Revelation 12 uh, battle between Michael and his angel and Satan and his angels. Could it be that this event over Nuremberg, Germany, they were witnessing um, the end of that battle up in the sky. And when they saw the objects falling down to the earth in smoke, was that Satan and his one third angel being thrown out of heaven and coming down? You know, maybe, um, show with you guys how the other night when I was flying, I saw what looked like three stars kind of moving around in an orbit above me. Um, it looked like they were up in you know, sky and everybody 
cause of UFOs. Um, but I don't know. I don't think they're aliens from other planet. Uh, we'll talk. We're gonna have to talk about UFOs in a uh, in another class. But you know, could those be angels? I thought about this a bit when I was uh, seeing those those three UFOs the other night. I thought about this Nuremberg, Germany event, um, how this is kind of what they saw, you know. Um, I don't know. Makes you makes you wonder. Makes you think about, you know, these things. You know, in Revelation chapter twelve, everybody thinks, oh, you know, it's just figurative. It means like, well, I don't know. You know, maybe it's literal. Maybe these things did happen. Maybe it was a battle up in the sky in 1561, and that's what these people reported that they were seeing. Um, and then ever since then, if that's the case, and that was when they were thrown down on Earth, ever since then. They've been waging war on Jews and Christians because it says in Revelation 12 that after he was thrown down, he was angry and he declared war on those who keep God's commandments, the Jews, and those who maintain their testimony for Jesus, Christians. Interesting enough, ever since then, after that came, you know, the uh, the Renaissance and just a uh, it seems like an, an attack of science on God and trying to everything that was believed about God just starting to be this unraveling of it, you know, evolution, um, the cosmos being different than what was believed, you know, leading all the way to today with the Big Bang and, you know, now aliens from other planets, you know, maybe we're not as significant as we thought right at least that's the idea so who knows maybe it's all a big deception ever since uh satan declared war on us christians um the war on the jews though you could that one's easy to identify um you remember this guy adolf hitler trying to annihilate the jews in world war ii that's just one of many attempts to annihilate the jews there's a attempt to annihilate them right now as we speak um but they're still here. So bottom line, this war is raging. It's raging in our midst. We're in the middle of us. Christians are not immune to it. Um, we get in Revelation 12 that those who maintain their testimony for Jesus is us. And Satan has declared war against us. So we're in this middle. We're in the middle of this war, whether we know it or not. And uh, that's what's going to lead. That's the road that's going to lead to the tribulation. So left you with these parting words of encouragement from the Apostle Paul. Um, very important to remember now as you start realizing like, whoa, there is a war going on. We're in, we're in the middle of it. If you're a Christian, you're smack in the middle of it and you are a target. Um, I know here in America, it's relatively safe to be a Christian, but uh, as time goes on, it'll be harder and the persecution will increase. Um, I need you guys to read Matthew chapter 24 and you'll see how Jesus warns us of what's coming. It's important to know that chapter as a Christian um, by heart. I'm not saying memorize it, but you need to know Matthew chapter 24. Um, but to remind you, as Paul did, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. People are not our enemy, right? Um, we've been instructed to go and share the gospel with people, to lead people to Christ, to get saved. That's still our great commission. Um, but what? who is our enemy, right? And this is where we ended today, and we're going to pick up with uh, next week with this verse, how it says, we're fighting against evil rulers. Interesting. Uh, like, what are evil? Who are evil rulers, right? Um, makes sense that Satan would go, if he needs to influence the world, he'd go after rulers of nations, um, evil authorities. What are the authorities behind the curtains that we don't see on a day-to-day -day basis that are kind of ruling everything? So uh, we'll talk about Babylon uh, over the next two lessons and uh, kind of talk about New World Order and that kind of stuff. Um, mighty powers in this dark world fallen angels. Uh, we know that a third is down here on earth with Satan and he has his forces there. And the evil spirits, which we talked about, the demons that are wandering the earth. This is this is who we're all, um, this is our enemy. 
It's not just Satan, one guy stand alone. He has forces. He's got evil rulers at his, his disposal. He's got evil authorities, people who follow him and are influenced by him and have authority over the world. He's got fallen angels. He's got demons. I mean, he's got an army out there and he has openly declared war on Jews and Christians uh, found in Revelation 12. So we'll, we'll continue this next week um, as we start getting into Mystery Babylon and New World Order and that kind of stuff in preparation for the tribulation. So I'll post on Sunday uh, the next lecture. I'm going to be referencing Revelation chapter 17 for that. So if you want to do a little read ahead, you can. Um, talks about, gives us good insight on Babylon and the New World Order and Satan and even the coming of his uh, Antichrist. And then uh, we'll discuss it next week. God bless.